So my name is Drew Gallatin, and I'm from Netflix, and I focus on uh, basically CPU efficiency and trying to serve uh, as many customers as we can from as little hardware as we can, uh, both to save the environment and to save ourselves some costs. So for the last little bit, I've been trying to push the envelope with serving as much as we can from a single box. And I'm here to talk to you about getting as close as we can to serving 400 gigs from a, a single server on FreeBSD. So I'm going to talk about uh, you know, why we want to do this. And I'm going to describe a little bit about our uh, production platform and talk about uh, the workload that we have. And then talk a little bit about whether or not we need NUMA or not to achieve these goals. Uh, talk a little bit about hardware inline TLS, which is in FreeBSD we call NIC TLS. And then if I have time at the end, I'll loop around and look at some alternate platforms in addition to the production platform that I'll be talking about for most of the talk. All right, since 2020, we've been rolling out uh, some servers that uh, have been able to serve 200 gigs of uh, TLS encrypted video. So that's really cool. Um, the thing is, these servers actually have four 100 gig net network ports. And we've always thought, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could actually light them all up and serve 400 gigs uh, from these machines rather than two? So let's look at what the, let's look at our uh, workload a little bit. So we run FreeBSD Current. Uh, we're generally, you know, a few weeks behind head, not not too far. Uh, we run the Nginx web server, and we serve our video uh, almost entirely via send file, and that means that we love kernel TLS because that uh, means the data is encrypted in the kernel as part of the send file pipeline, which means we don't have any extra boundary crossings where data is like, you know, pulled off a disk and encrypted user space and then written back to the kernel, you know, none of those detours. And just by itself, software kernel TLS saves us like roughly 60% CPU. Um, the production platform I am keep referring to is an AMD, uh, Epic 7502P, which is otherwise known as a Rome. It has 32 cores at two and a half gigahertz. And the more important thing is it has eight channels of uh, DDR4-3200. And that's enough for 150 gigabytes a second of memory bandwidth. And now through this talk, I'm gonna be talking about networking stuff, which is gigabits and st like storage slash memory bandwidth stuff, which is typically gigabytes. I'm going to try to remember to go back and forth by that factor of eight. And if I forget that, I apologize. But I'm just going to try to do both things here and mention that that's about uh, 1.2 terabits of, uh, of bandwidth in terms of memory bandwidth. We have plenty of I.O. We have um, basically 128 lanes of uh, PCIe Gen 4, which is uh, about two terabits in networking units. So all that sounds good. And like I mentioned before, we have two uh, Mellanox Connect X6 DX NICs. They connect at uh, Gen 4 uh, and by 16, and they have two full speed ports each. So that's four 100 gig ports. And hence our motivation, we want to use all four of those ports. Um, and we have a whole bunch of NVMe drives, and these machines were spec'd out way before uh, we uh, you know, fund a full speed uh, Gen 4 drive. So we have just a lot of Gen 3 drives. So our initial performance results on this platform are about 240 gigabits a second. Uh, and this is with software kernel TLS. And we're limited primarily by memory bandwidth. And the way that I know that, um, I'm not just mystical. Basically, AMD has given us tools. Uh, and you can I think you can get this tool yourself if you Google for it, AMD UProf PCM. And it reads the system counters and it tells you what the memory bandwidth is. So the um, so the the gist of it is that you know we we reached the the rated system memory bandwidth at about 240 gigabits a second, and at that point you know things start to collapse. So to understand where the bandwidth is going, I'm going to bring you back to this slide that uh, should look familiar if you saw my talk two years ago. And in fact, a lot of the, this next section is going to look familiar if you saw my talk two years ago. So I apologize for that. Basically, um, now I wish I had a laser pointer. I was trying to play with my mouse and it just doesn't work well enough to, to see. But essentially the data flow is that um, a Netflix client uh, 
you know, you're watching a you're watching a movie. Netflix client has an algorithm where it says it wants to to fetch you know so many megabytes ahead. So it, it says it wants to fetch to the next two megabytes. And nginx gets a request for that, the, and it, it launches a uh, a send file request to satisfy it. And what what happens there is that the uh, the data is brought in from those this NVMe drives in the lower left hand corner, and it's you know in aggregate it's read 50 gigabytes a second. And it's read into system memory. Now, once it's read into system memory, we have to encrypt it to send it on the wire. So the CPU then reads it out of memory again, uh, encrypts it, and then allocates a, a separate destination buffer, which is you know kind of an, an important aside. Basically, most crypto does uh, crypto in place, but because we're talking about files here that live in the in the you know the, the page cache, we cannot encrypt in place because if we did, then that would if uh, I was streaming something and you were streaming something and we encrypted it to my uh, TLS keys, then you would get something that was encrypted uh, doubly and it would just be garbage and it would be a bad day. So we have to encrypt to a separate uh, TLS crypto buffer. So once we do that, we write it back out at 50 gigabytes a second. And then the network uh, card comes along and DMAs it and sends it out on the wire. And that's another 50 gigabytes a second. So if you add all those things up, that's, um, that 50, that 50 gigabytes a second gets multiplied by four, so you wind up with um, four. You wind up with 200 gigabytes a second, or 1.2 terabits. Or sorry, 1.6 terabits a second of of bandwidth that you need to achieve your goal. And obviously, we don't have that much memory bandwidth. So, one of the things I was wondering is, can Numa get us closer? So. One of the things NUMA does is it makes, uh, when you run AMD machines in NUMA mode, and I'm going to explain what NUMA is in a second, but if you run AMD machines in NUMA mode, you can end up making more efficient use of their memory controllers. And so if you look at stream results, like, you know, on the web, you see that for the system that we have, people generally get about 150 gigabytes a second from uh, in, in flat mode. But if you run the AMD system in four nodes per socket, you get about 175 gigabytes a second. And so what is NUMA? So NUMA is uh, non-uniform memory architecture. Now, this is the stuff that these slides are basically dupes of what I did two years ago. They're a background. If you already know this, then you know, get a cup of coffee. Basically, it means that uh, you know, memory or devices can be closer to each other. So if you go back in the, in the early days when we built uh, big multiprocessors, you could just plug in uh, CPUs and memory and disk wherever you wanted to. Everything was equally close to everything else. Software people just didn't have to care about where things were, but it didn't scale very well. So hardware people eventually realized that they, the best thing to do was to divide and conquer. And so it, what they came up with was this NUMA system where essentially you can tie multiple computers together with the NUMA bus. So if you, if you look at the system on the left and the system on the right inside those, uh, inside those uh, blue circles, Essentially, each one of those systems is almost a complete computer. It has a network card, it has memory, it has disks, and it has a processor. And ideally, you wanted to stay within that blue circle. If you don't, if you cross that red dotted line, then you wind up uh, uh, crossing the NUMA bus, and your access to the things on that side of the on that side of the computer ends up being slower. You know, different NUMA buses have different efficiencies. The penalty could be almost nothing, or it could be really severe. It just depends on on what you're talking about. So it gets even more complicated with, with the AMD uh, epics because the most efficient way to run them is to run them in four nodes per socket mode. And so now we've just sort of multiplied the problem. And instead of having two NUMA domains, we, now we have four. And luckily, they're all interconnected. Um, so you just get a picture of like how complicated things get. And the latency penalties to cross these dotted lines, depending on which ones you cross and what you're doing, uh, can be anywhere from 12 to 28 nanoseconds, so it's it's not free. And the bandwidth limit is a for the system that we have is about 47 gigabytes a second per link, or 280 gigabytes a second total. So basically, the strategy that I came up with a few years ago is to keep as much of our bulk data off the NUMA fabric as we can. Essentially, you can sort of think of you know if you if you have a highway and you want to, uh, you don't want to fill it up with uh, big semi trucks and then block the block the commuter cars. 
basically, if you if your highway is full of this bulk data, like these big semi semi trucks, then the commuter cars can't get through on their urgent missions, and you wind up uh, blocking the CPU while while you wait for small things to get through. And I'm talking about even simple things like you know updating a counter that lives in a different NUMA domain or Maybe a process, uh, you know, needs to read needs to read something from some other NUMA domain. It's you want to keep those links as idle as you can. So I'm going to go through and talk about kind of the data flow and the worst things that could possibly happen. So in the worst case, um, a request comes in, and let's say it comes into the lower left uh, NUMA node. And I really wish I had a laser pointer because this makes this a lot better. Maybe you can see my maybe you can see my mouse moving. Um, the request comes in here, and we happen to have the content in a different place. So we asked to, we asked to, whoops, we asked to read the content and the content goes into the, uh, into the, the node on the upper right hand side, uh, because we allocated the, the memory in the wrong place. Since it was actually in our local node, we probably should have allocated memory here, but we were just too dumb to do that. So now we cross the NUMA bus. And now, uh, once it's in memory, the CPU needs to read it to encrypt it. And so ideally we pick a CPU that was up here, uh, and the same node. But since we're being stupid, uh, we pick one that's on the lower right-hand side, and we cross the NUMA bus again. Now, after uh, after we encrypt it, we need to put it somewhere, so we have to allocate a destination crypto buff. And once we and once we you know if we were being smart, we'd allocate it right where we are, but we're not, so we allocate one in the upper uh, left-hand side. And after all is said and done, we're, we need to send it out, and that network card is on the lower left-hand side. And so we crossed the NUMA bus uh, basically four times, and that's pretty close to the aggregate fabric bandwidth, and that causes the fabric to congest, and that's uh, that's bad. So we don't want to do that. We have to do something a little bit smarter. So in the best case, in the ideal case, we just stay in that we just stay on that lower left hand side there and never leave it, and that would lead to zero NUMA crossings and nothing on the fabric. Um, that's where we that's where we want to get, but how close can we get? And basically, we're constrained to using one IP address uh, per machine, and we're using LACP for bonding. So I came up with two ideas back in the day. One is to sort of focus on where the content lives. I call that disk-centric siloing. And one is to focus on um, where the connection came in, and then I call that network-centric siloing. And basically, this, this word, that what, what the LACP partner chose for is essentially when you're using LACP, the link partners will hash, uh, you know, on their own criteria, typically based on TCP ports uh, and uh, and IP addresses, to 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 get a good sharding of traffic to all the link members. And it's a consistent, as long as the lag doesn't isn't uh, isn't fl flapping and members coming and going, that hashing is consistent. So you wind up with the same connection going to the same NIC all the time. So. What I moved forward with was the network-centric siloing. And I, I actually fleshed out this disk siloing, and I have some backup slides at the end if I have questions about that. I've run that to completion, and, and I believe that network-centric siloing is by far the best way to go. So basically, you allocate um, the network connections uh, you know, with affinity to the NUMA nodes. Uh, you allocate memory to back the media files uh, when they're dma from disk local. You allocate local memory for TLS crypto, and you run TLS workers, uh, H, you know, TCP pacers, TCP timers and all that kind of stuff with domain affinity, and you choose a local NIC to send the, the to send the, the results back to the client. So all of this is actually upstream. I think it might even be in 13. I mean, we run current. I don't track 13 very well, but I know all of this stuff is is actually upstream. So now let's look at the worst case when we're making these better decisions. It's the same scenario as before. Essentially, the uh, Network connection comes in on the uh, on the lower left side. Um, this time, though, the content lives on the right side. Just so I have something to something to show you. So what happens is uh, we allocate a local buffer on the lower left hand side to to store the content when it comes in from disk. Um, now, when we go to encrypt it, we choose that same uh, local CPU. Once we've once we write it back, we've allocated a crypto buffer that's local, and then we send it and we write it back there. And then we send it back out on the network card that it came in on. And boom, uh, we've only crossed the NUMA bus once rather than four times. So basically, the worst case is we cross it once. Uh, we only put 50 gigabytes rather than 200 gigabytes. And all that's good. That helps a lot. The real problem, though, is that 
uh, real life is messy. Uh, remember I said those NICs were two by 100? So that means that you can only put two NICs in Newman domains because you have two Newman domains that don't have NICs because there's no need for them because we have we already have 400 gig links and NICs are expensive and we don't want to replicate them all around. So right now I have uh, hacks to sort of pretend that a NIC is that uh, one of the ports is in a different domain, um, and this impacts the, uh, the the worst in the average cases in the following way. So basically that NIC uh, really isn't isn't down on the left hand side anymore. Actually it's like up on the upper left hand side. And so rather than uh, going right out that same NUMA node at the, at the end, you actually have to go across uh, across NUMA again. And that impacts uh, the worst case by now, instead of putting 50 gigs on, on the NUMA bus, we're putting 100 gigs. Now, if you, if you look at the average case, it gets a little bit better. So if you, if you think about it, if you have four nodes, um, then there's basically a one in four chance that the content's going to be local. So uh, we're a three in four chance that you're going to, it's not going to be local. So you have a 75% chance that you're going to cross the NUMA bus there to find content that's not local. And then since we have uh, two domains with NICs and two domains without, you're going to have a 50% chance you're going to need to cross the NUMA bus to go out on a, on a, on a NIC that actually exists. So that leads us to about 62 and a half gigabytes a second of data on the NUMA fabric, which is still a whole lot better than, than, uh, than the, the, uh, the numbers, we, the 200 gigabytes that we would get if we weren't being smart. So did it help? Yeah, it helped a little. Um, and it was no, pan it was no panacea, but it gets us from about 240 to about 280, which is, you know, n better than nothing, but still, you know, not anywhere near our goals. That might, uh, you know, make it worth lighting up a third link, but definitely not lighting up all four links. So can we do better? And when I'm asking that question, basically I'm looking at, uh, at, at Nick uh, to KTLS. So, if you remember that diagram back at the beginning of the presentation, um, these uh, these vertical green lines have always bugged the hell out of me. So if you can see my mouse moving around, these lines here and here, where essentially the CPU has to read the uh, the data out of, has to read the plain text data out of uh, memory, encrypt it, and then push it back. And it doesn't even need to be the CPU. It could be a QAT uh, or, or a Chelsea CCR or look aside card. Whatever it is, it's got to read the data out of memory and write it back. And that's the heart, that's the, the part we want to get rid of. So if we could get rid of these, this extra kind of detour through the CPU or through an accelerator card, we could essentially cut our memory bandwidth requirements in half. And things kind of drop down to the case where it's almost like things are unencrypted. Data flows in from the disks into memory and out, uh, and out the NICs and the CPU just kind of just stays uninvolved. So, Let's talk about this magic thing. What is NIC KTLS? So basically it's what the rest of the world calls hardware inline TLS. Um, so normally in KTLS, a session's established in user space, that's still the same. But now when crypto's moved to the kernel, the kernel kind of turns around and you know just does a hot potato and hands the crypto off to the NIC. Um, and so the, the TLS records are encrypted by the NIC as uh, the data flows through it on transmit. So the positive things is there's no more detour through the CPU for crypto, and we we uh, and we reduced our our memory bandwidth requirements. The, the negative thing for some people is that uh, all of a sudden your data, which used to be encrypted in user space, and then and and then so it was all it was always encrypted in the kernel. Now with KTLS, it's in the clear in the kernel, and now that moves that even further away. So it's in the clear on the other going across BCI Express. And you know I realize some people may have problems with that. Uh, for this workload, I don't but it's just to put it out there. So the NICs that we're using for this are the uh, Mellanox Connect X6DX. They offload uh, TLS 1.2 and 1.3 for AES GCM. That's by far our most uh, popular cipher and one of the most popular ciphers on the web. So the thing to re remember about these NICs is that they retain crypto state uh, within a TLS record. And that means that TCP can send the first couple segments off of a TLS record and stop for a while because it's waiting for an act. And then the act, a couple milliseconds, a couple seconds, whenever the act, the act later, the act can come in. And then once the act comes in, TCP can pick right back up in the middle of that TLS record and the NIC will have remembered the crypto state and things will just keep on going as normal. The bad case is if a packet is sent out of order, you know, a TCP retransmission. 
because at that point, the NIC no longer has the state from some arbitrary point in the TCP stream. And so it needs to do some extra work to recover that state. So I'm gonna go through a little diagram which kind of describes uh, how uh, transmits work with the ConnectX60X for TLS. All right, so this, this eye chart here, essentially what we've got going on is in the that uh, upper rectangle is a representation of host memory with uh, a TLS record unencrypted sitting in a socket buffer. The numbers you see are essentially TCP uh, segment boundaries. So you notice it starts at 0, 1448, 2896, and so on. Um, and then you see the PCI Express bus uh, representation of the NIC and then a 100 gig network. So when uh, we go to send something, basically the NIC will, the TCP will say, hey, I want to send the first, you know, four or five, six segments of the packet. And then the NIC will go and DMA them. Uh, and it may do something smarter than this. I don't know how their NIC works. It may you know, DMA 4K at a time, it may DMA the individual segments, I, I have no idea. It's all hidden from us. But the NIC DMAs, uh, DMAs the plain text data down, it encrypts it um, in the NIC, and then it sends it out on the wire. And obviously it sends it as packets, not just a big burst because, you know, 1500 byte MTU, but, uh, you know, my, my artistic abilities are limited, so that's what this diagram looks like. Um, now, TCP comes along later, and says, hey, I want to send the next five segments from this from this packet. And so then the NIC, uh, you know, as you would expect, the NIC DMAs them down, it encrypts them, and it sends them on the wire. And then time passes, we get some more acts, more more window spaces freed up. TCP says, hey, I want to send that last uh, segment. And so the um, the NIC DMAs it down, encrypts it, and sends it on the wire. That's all well and good. And you can see that the NIC doesn't have to do any extra work when he leaves off in the middle. Uh, it's just all straightforward. It, you, you could the TCP could do the whole segment or TCP could just do a part of a segment. It doesn't matter. But for a retransmit, let's say that, uh, you know, your your cell phone was flaky and you lost that one chunk out of the out of the video stream and you send a sack for it and TCP needs to resend that uh, that that segment at uh, 14K. So what you would expect is you'd expect uh, to see you expect to see something like like this, where the NIC just DMAs it down, encrypts it, and sends it on the wire. But no, what has to happen is because the NIC no longer has the state for this arbitrary position in the TCP stream. What has to happen is the NIC has to DMA the entire TLS record from the all the way down uh, to the NIC. Encrypts it has to encrypt all of that up to the point of the uh, of the current uh, segment in order to get the crypto state. Once it gets the crypto state, it can encrypt that one segment we want to send and it can send it on the wire. So that's a little bit painful. And that means that we have to watch out for, for TCP retransmissions because they could easily run us out of PCI Express bandwidth. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. So, First, I'm going to just talk about some results. Uh, I mean, this is basically a talk about war stories. There's no, there's no, no, no new tales to tell here. So basically, we got a, a very early beta firmware from Mellanox. Uh, so I think it was like it was way, it was before the pandemic, and we had pretty good peak bandwidth. We got about 250 gigabits a second total out of the system. Um, the problem is that the sustained bandwidth was was pretty terrible. So what happened was basically. The way our systems work is that we attract load via uh, this thing we call health, which runs off of a PID controller with various inputs. A lot of the and the, a lot of the inputs are things like, you know, is the network card close to capacity? Is, is the CPU saturated? Are the disks saturated? And whatnot. Um, so what happened was, as we kept adding more and more sessions, uh, the CPU was very low. Network card was nowhere near its limits. Um, and so we said, we're healthy. Give me more traffic. Give me more traffic. Uh, and as more and more connections arrived, the NIC slowed down more and more. And so we wound up uh, at a floor of about 75 gigs in NIC or 150 gigs per system. And we just kept attracting more and more and more clients. And it sort of turned into a tar pit uh, because th this kind of limit is invisible to our PID controller. So we really didn't like this um, because of that, re for that reason. And it was not a big enough advantage for us to use uh, to, to move forward with, with inline TLS. Now, 
what exactly was happening. So all of this is my supposition. It's not anything that I know from like talking to Mellox or NDA stuff or anything like that. But basically, we know that the Nick Storrs TLS state procession. We know that because it can resume in the middle of a TLS record. And we know that we at Netflix have a ginormous number of, TL of TLS sessions active. Each client has multiple video uh, connections, anywhere between one, one, typically two to four to six. Buggy, buggy clients have had tens or hundreds. Uh, we have um, one audio and one subtitle connection. So by a rule of thumb, we kind of estimate what we need 400,000 sessions for 400 gigabits. And we notice that the performance gets worse the more sessions we add. And my supposition is that there's a limited amount of memory on the NIC and that I know from reading the Mellanox driver that it will allocate host memory um, and on behalf of the NIC and let the NIC do whatever it wants with that memory. So my supposition is that uh, what's happening is that the memory on the NIC uh, is exceeded once we have too many sessions and it's just paging in and out of the host and things just get really bad once that memory is thrashed. Don't know that for sure. Never got confirmation from Mellanox on that, but that's what that's what I suspect. So AMD suggested we, we enable PCI relaxed ordering. Um, and what PCI relaxed ordering does is it basically allows uh, things to pass each other. So that the theory is that that would help with, with paging in this TLS connection state. So we enabled it, um, it didn't help, but later we found out that uh, the ConnectX6 firmware, even though you could toggle that bit in PCI uh, config space, it didn't actually, wasn't actually connected to anything and nothing actually happened because it was hard coded off. Time passes and we get a new firmware and this one's much better. This one actually uh, enabled re relaxed ordering and they may have done some other things. I mean, I don't have access to their firmware, but all I know is that this one, we got 160 gigabits per second per NIC or 320 gigabits a second total. Uh, and at this point, we were much happier because the peak and the sustained were essentially uh, the same. It, the peak was a little bit higher, but basically our machine wasn't turning it into a tar pit. Um, this is a, was a new record for us. 320 gigs is a lot better than the 200 and some gigs we're getting from software TLS. And on a, on a per NIC basis, it's nearly as fast as software TLS, uh, you know, 160 versus 190 gigabits per NIC. And while I'm talking about per NIC, I mean, the, like on one of these machines, if you just disable one of the NICs and, you know, run it uh, with software TLS, you can see that the NIC can push 190 gigabits. I mean, you, you can't get 190 gigabits from two because of the memory bandwidth limits. So anyway, um, a few months later, we, you know, we thought that was about as good as it was going to get. A few months later, uh, they surprised us with a new uh, production firmware, which had a knob called TLS Optimized. I still don't know what that does, except it makes things much better. Um, and now we get 190 gigabits per second in NIC or 380 gigabits a second total. So that's a pretty good number. Let's, let's start using it. Well, eh, wait a second. We're Netflix. We can't actually start using things yet. We have to do QOE testing. And QE is basically the, the quality of experience for the customer. So we measure things like like the rebuffer rate, you know, like how long the like how many times you get that little spinny when you're watching a Netflix Netflix uh, watch, yeah, when you're watching a Netflix video, how long it takes between pressing play and you seeing the you seeing the video show up, how long it takes between when you when you start playing and when the video looks decent um, or excellent really. And the initial results from this NIC were good. Now that's the contrast. We we tried a NIC in the past, which did not have this feature of being able to pick up in the middle of a TLS session. That NIC, uh, in order to make it work, we had to, well, really Randall Stewart um, had to essentially hack the TCP uh, code to become aware of TLS record boundaries and to try super, super hard to only send uh, data around TLS record boundaries. And that, that caused really a miserable QOE. And so we couldn't move forward with this other NIC. Because this NIC can, uh, can resume uh, where it left off, uh, the QOE is fine. So we did an initial study, everything went fine. Now that we have uh, more of these deployed, we have more experience, we're gonna do a larger, more complete study before we enable it. The other thing we need to do before we enable it is to come up with a way to uh, defend against TCP retransmits. So if you remember uh, those slides, uh, way, 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 way back when, uh, where I was talking about what happens when we do a retransmit. So what happens here is 
you wind up with, uh, you know, essentially almost like an amplification attack. So whether it's intentional or not, if you have a lossy TCP connection, it can run you out of PCI Express bandwidth fast. So you want to make sure that this doesn't happen. Uh, you know, this almost never happens. So the way we do that is, oops, the way we do that is um, to monitor the bytes retransmitted uh, on lossy networks and to move connections from hardware back into software once uh, once they exceed a certain threshold of retransmits. And we also monitor uh, in segments uh, that are retransmitted in case some hacker gets clever and decides, well, I'm not going to ask for very many bytes retransmitted, but I might ask for a lot of segments. And that's still going to make the NIC re-DMA all that stuff. And in that case, we'll probably kill the connect, we'll re kill the connections rather than moving them to software since it's pretty clear it's an attack. So one interesting note here is that the mixed hardware and software uh, performance is interesting. So I've noticed that if I move um, basically, and I basically set the threshold to 1%, meaning that if a TCP connection has more than 1% retransmitted bytes, he gets moved to software. Then that moves roughly 25 to 33% of connections to software. And that moves our max stable bandwidth down from 380 to 350 gigabits a second. Uh, and that's a larger impact than I would expect. Uh, and I'm, that's something that, that I need to look into because just a third of the connections really shouldn't be putting that much stress on the system. Memory, memory, memory bandwidth looks fine. The, I, the, the, latency, the DMA latency looks fine. I, I just don't understand why it's as bad as it is. All right, so I'm going to now we're going to talk about well what happens when we combine these two techniques. Uh, you know, when we combine uh, kernel TLS and NUMA. This is a sort of the you put your chocolate in my peanut butter kind of moment if you remember those ads from the 80s. So now this is the same diagram as we had before, um, except things get a lot simpler. So the TLS connection uh, comes in on the lower left hand side. The mem again the uh, the the data lives up in the upper right hand side, and we bring it to the lower left hand side. So now instead of doing any crypto or anything, boom, we just send it out on the NIC. So everything's well and good, um, much simpler. And now in real life, if you remember, we don't have NICs on every node. So in this case, we might need to send it out on the NIC on the upper left-hand side. Um, essentially, the worst case is essentially the worst case that we had before and nothing changes. Uh, and the average case is the same average case in terms of numeric crossings as we had before, nothing changes. The only thing really that changes is that detour through memory is just completely avoided and we save some memory bandwidth. So here's a big eye chart for you of all the performance numbers that I've talked about so far. First, we start off with uh, software TLS, um, where we get about 240 gigabits a second and we're at about 80% CPU of when, you know, when the memory system saturates. And then with software TLS and NUMA, we get to about uh, 280, again, at 80% CPU. Now, if we run the AMDs in uh, flat mode, just with one uh, node per socket, we wind up with, um, and, and, and we use uh, hardware kernel TLS, we wind up with 380 gigs uh, at, I don't know, about 60-ish percent CPU. And NUMA with uh, hardware TLS, doesn't change the bandwidth at all. It's still about 380, but it drops the CPU to just a hair over 50%. Um, and then if we go go back to the the uh, the, uh, you know, the configuration that we're actually probably going to deploy, essentially we have uh, hardware TLS in a flat topology with uh, some safety some safety belts to keep uh, lossy connections from gumming things up. We wind up with about uh, you know in this in this upper 60 lower 70% CPU at uh, about 350 gigs. So in the, what do I have left? I've got about uh, 10 minutes left. In, in the end here, I'm gonna talk about some alternate platforms we, we looked at. The, one of the interesting alternate platforms we looked at was uh, the Ampere uh, Ultra, which is a, a three gigahertz 80 CPU ARM uh, Neoverse. And if you kind of squint, it looks very similar to the AMD. It's got the same uh, number of memory channels, same size memory, same number of PCIe lanes, roughly the same storage and the same networking. So really, you know, the only important thing that gets swapped out here is the CPU, which is a completely different architecture. And because it's a different architecture, uh, 
at least on FreeBSD, I don't currently have a way to do all the fun stuff I do on Intel and AMD, like looking at uh, memory bandwidth being used and running fancy profilers and looking at IO bandwidth being used. And so it kind of makes me feel like I'm kind of driving blind. So when we uh, initially started playing with it, we got some really poor performance with Salper kernel TLS. I think we got like 120 or 140 gigabits a second. Mark Johnson uh, came up with an idea, which is brilliant and which I kick myself for not thinking of, but all brilliant ideas are obvious in hindsight. And he came up with the idea of using a, uh, a UMA uh, cache zone to cache 16K contiguous uh, TLS crypto destination buffers. And once we did that, we got up to about 180 gigabits a second. Um, so that's pretty good. Still not uh, AMD level, but it's pretty good. Um, and then we tried NIC TLS, the hardware TLS, and we found that we were PCIe limited at about 240 gigs. Um, the CPU utilization was shockingly low. It was like, you know, in the 20% range. The NICs, but the NICs were saturated and started uh, dropping on output. When I was looking at this, I noticed that um, one difference between the AMD systems and the Ampere systems is that extended tags were not uh, were not enabled. So I'm not sure who's responsible for enabling them, but on Ampere uh, with uh, with FreeBSD, they just didn't get enabled. So basically, the importance of extended tags is, is PCI Express is almost more like a network than a bus, and just like in TCP, when you increase the window size. If you can increase the PCI Express tag space, you can have more sort of more balls in the air at the same time, which uh, gives you a bigger pipeline and leads, leads, to bigger leads to bigger bandwidth. By default, the PCI Express tag space is just five bits or 32 tags. If you enable extended tags, then you get uh, three, uh, you get eight bits and 256 uh, tags. And once, once we did that, uh, we got the bandwidth up to 320 gigs a second. Still not AMD performance, but I don't have as much experience on this platform. I don't have the tools that I have everywhere else. It's possible that we could do better. I mean, I don't want to sell Ampere short, but it's this is where we are right now. And the last platform I want to talk about is a platform I literally uh, got into a data center like last week sometime. Um, and it's the uh, Intel Ice Lake Xeon. It took us forever to get this uh, working because of storage. Basically, it's only the difference between uh, this system, you know, besides the CPU is that it's only got 64 lanes of Gen 4, which means we can't use, you know, a, 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 an insane number of Gen 3 drives. We have to use Gen 4 drives and, or we have to use a PCI Express switch. And the switches that we, we were using had weird problems. So, it, you know, real life messy details. This is the first time we were able to build something close to a full speed system. So it has 20 uh, Kioxia, uh, four terabyte NVMe drives, and again, the same two uh, Melnox NICs. One important difference here is that we have eight channels of, uh, of DDR3200, but this SKU of the Intel Xeon runs them at 2933. I personally hate that. I wish Intel ran all their memory at the same speed like everybody else does across, across their product lines, but it is what it is. So the Intel results are limited by uh, by memory bandwidth at about 230 gigabits a second. It makes sense because the memory is running at a slower speed than on the AMD. And so the performance is basically, you would expect the performance to be the same as, as AMD uh, flat mode if you uh, if you had the memory running at the same speed. Um, so basically I wanted to try uh, hardware TLS, but I'm running the BIOS from Hal, uh, and we've which is which locks out everything. I got a fix on like Friday uh, to to enable uh, relaxed ordering to see if we could get some better performance from uh, from Nick, T, Nick uh, KTLS, and unfortunately the fix didn't work, so I don't have any results that I'm comfortable with presenting. Um, but here's a little summary of where we are with the alternate platforms, the software TLS bandwidth. So on AMD, we have uh, about 280. Um, on Ampere, we have about uh, 180. And on Intel, we have about 230. And for the max hardware TLS bandwidth on AMD, we have about 380. And on Ampere, we have about 320. And I was going to end this with something really impressive because we built an 800 gig machine. Unfortunately, we had some storms in the USA, which uh, delayed shipping, which meant that 
the machine didn't get to the data center in time to get racked. So maybe I'll be back next year to talk about 800 gigs or something along those lines. In the uh, in the five minutes left, um, oh, first I want to thank everybody who helped, especially on the Netflix side, Warren Haroop. Uh, he's one of the people that works on new hardware at Netflix and is in charge of building a lot of these prototypes. And so he's like my Santa Claus and brings me all my new toys. Um, and I also want to thank the FreeBSD, yeah, the FreeBSD developers who I've worked with over the years on these things, especially uh, Mark Johnson for all of his work on both NUMA and the VM system and KTLS, uh, John Baldwin for doing the bulk of the hard work of upstreaming uh, KTLS for us and working with different vendors to, to hammer out a hardware KTLS interface. And also to um, Jeff Roberson for all of his hard work on NUMA. And I'm sure I'm forgetting people and that's, I don't intend to slight anybody, but I just love working in the community and every, everything, that, uh, everything that we've done is a collaboration. I have my slides are up uh, after the talk. And so now I, have, now I have some time for questions. I think I have like four minutes. Should I just start? Do I just start reading off the? Uh, yeah, I'll start reading off the panel here if I can get my mouse over there. Uh, if you switch to the uh, shared notes tab at the top, we've organized the questions for you. Oh, okay. Let's see how that. It's bubbling up. There we go. All right. Is Nick is Nick KTLS available in current? Yes. Uh, it is. It's available in current. I actually think it's available in thirteen. Um, but it only works with certain NICs. Uh, in FreeBSD, I believe the only NICs it'll work with is the ConnectX 60X and the uh, Chelsea OT6. Um, how fast is NFS over, uh, over TLS? I don't know. That's something we'd have to, to talk to Rick about. Are we using PLX chips to connect Gen 3 to Gen 4? Um, we were using um, Broadcom. I think Broadcom, did Broadcom buy PLX? I don't remember. Um, the, we, we were having some interesting problems with Broadcom PCI switches where they would run at seemingly Gen 3 bandwidths. Uh, if, if, you, if you put like one or two, I think it was like a Gen 4 by 8 to, to 4 Gen 3 by 4s. And if you put two Gen 3 by 4s active, everything was good. But if you got over, if you got over two, then things were running at Gen 3 speeds. That's why we that's why we had all kinds of problems like you know building a machine with just 64 PCIe lanes. Would faster DDR memory available to client SKUs help to bump fabric? I'm not sure what you mean clients. Oh, do you mean like the you mean like gamer machines? Um, yeah, it, in terms of fabric bandwidth, I think the Infinity fabric is limited, but it would definitely help with memory bandwidth. I've I've often like. I used to overclock memory uh, in servers a while ago. Um, no, we d and no, we don't use total TCP offloading. So we have a essentially a whole uh, group at Netflix that's parallel to our group, which focuses solely on protocol improvements. So that's people like Randall Stewart uh, and Lawrence Stewart, no relation, uh, that do a lot of the TCP work. And we one of the things that we depend on is to uh, to control every aspect of the TCP stack. And that's what allows us to give such good QE to our customers. So how many how many flows can the NICs handle? What happens on overflow? Um, I kind of talked about that a little bit. Uh, I believe the limit is, you know, I don't even know what the, the limit is. I thought it was 128,000 per port, but I'm not sure. And what happens on overflow is that the hardware, hard, the hardware TLS session is just not set up and it falls back to software. Is the data encrypted in storage too? No, it's, I mean, the, our assets are, are DRM encrypted, which is between, uh, you know, somewhere, some encoding in the cloud and your set top box or your phone or whatever, but there, there's no extra layer of encryption at rest. So do you perform traffic steering to the optimal, optimal NIC? Uh, no, we don't. We, we, we live with the, uh, the decision that our, our link partner, uh, gave us. Now there, Somebody grabbed me after my last a couple of years ago after my last talk and said there is a protocol to tell LACP to redirect things, but we don't have that implemented, um, and so we just um, whoops, I have all the questions just appeared. Oh, there we go. So we just use the uh, you know whatever LACP gives us. How do we measure percent CPU? Um, 
basically, I just use the same numbers that, as you would see with VMstat. Um, in terms of front end stalls, on and, and actually, I don't, I don't use VMstat. I have a tool that I wrote. It's in ports. It's called nstat. It shows you various things like uh, memory bandwidth. Uh, sorry, it, it'll show you memory bandwidth if you hook it to Intel PCM. It shows you CPU use. It shows you um, number of TCP connections. It shows you network bandwidth. It shows you context switches, interrupts, all that kind of stuff, all in all in one uh, all in one one line. Um, I don't have any thoughts about the Xilinx uh, smart NICs. I am not aware of them. Um, typically, we try to go for Xilinx. Thing makes me think of PGA, and typically we try to go for ASICs just for uh, power uh, reasons. We have we were engaging with a, a NIC vendor that was building a uh, a different kind of TLS offload NIC where they had something like 40 or 64 gigs of memory in an FPGA on the NIC. And that, that changed the TCP retransmit story because they just uh, were able to cache everything in their NIC. And that was nice, except the NIC burned as much, I think the NIC burned as much power as the rest of the system. So it was just not a really good fit for us. Uh, and we're always willing to, we're always willing to try NICs. We've engaged with other vendors. I think that, um, I actually think the FreeBSD is ahead of the curve on NIC TLS. I know that Linux uses it, um, but I think we we are a little bit ahead of the curve because one of the things that's that I meant to mention is that when um, I was first working on kernel TLS, I had this idea of Nick TLS in my head, and I kind of kept that in mind when designing the way MBUFs work with 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 uh, kernel TLS. And the nice thing about FreeBSD, the way MBUFs work, is that a single MBUF describes an entire TLS record. So it makes these retransmits like really easy for the driver because the driver never, the driver can just look around in the same MBUF and it has all of what it needs to do a retransmit. Um, let's see, this question is being written. Oh, okay, that's just the answer is being written. Um, I guess that concludes my talk. If there's no more questions, go. Th thank you very much. All right, thank you.